Welcome to International Forum. We are continuing our conversation with special guest Joshua Bolton, former President George W. Bush's White House Chief of Staff from 2006 to the day he left office uh, when the Obama administration took over on Tuesday, January 20th, 2009. The office of the White House Chief of Staff is the highest uh, office and, and the Chief of Staff is the highest ranking member of the Executive Office of the President of the United States. The Chief of Staff is often said to be the second most powerful man in the country after the President, who is the most powerful man not only in the United States, but also in the world. And some consider the White House Chief of Staff as co-President, although I think Josh disagrees with that, uh, or the president's gatekeeper, uh, that is, uh, I think he agrees. Joshua Bolton had a long and distinguished career in the Bush White House. Before becoming President Bush's White House Chief of Staff, he was President Bush's Director of the Office of Management and Budget for three years. Before that, he was the Deputy White House Chief of Staff, and Joshua is also, I will, uh, I'm proud to say, a proud alumnus of Princeton University, class of 1976. Indeed. Since the fall of 2009, Josh Bolton has been teaching at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs uh, of Princeton University, where he is a John L. Weinberg, Goldman Sachs and Company visiting professor. He currently also serves with Prince, uh, uh, fellow Princetonian and former U.S. Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, who had appeared on our program earlier as co-chair of the bipartisan Clinton-Bush Haiti Fund. And I would like to mention that uh, an article uh, in the Washington Post uh, in 2008 had mentioned that uh, Joshua Bolton may be one of the most discreet White House Chiefs of Staff ever seldom talking on the record to the press or appearing uh, outside, uh, uh, before outside audiences. But today he has graciously agreed to talk to us on International Forum. So please join me in a warm welcome again to Josh Bolton. Thank you, May. So now we continue our conversation. I'd like to um, talk to you about your role in shaping policy, uh, first of all. Um, and, and, and maybe also some personnel appointment matters and refereeing among disputing presidents, men and women. President Bush called you a creative policy thinker at your swearing-in ceremony at the Oval Office in 2006. And your own brother, Randall, who is also a Princetonian class of 75, said policy had always fascinated him, meaning you. Which of some of President Bush's most important policies, both domestic and international, bear significant imprints by you? Well, um, I played the role of policy director in the president's first presidential campaign. So that was two years in Texas, even before the president became president and then two years as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy. So I had the luxury of being involved in basically all of the President's policies at the, at the start of the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't claim much imprint to any of the, uh, the particular policies. I do take a lot of pride in uh, having the President uh, put the, putting the president in a good position to pursue the things that he cared about most uh, in the national security area, in the homeland security area, in the domestic policy area where his, his passion was education, um, but also in the economic policy area uh, where he cared a great deal about um, putting the country on a firm fiscal foundation going forward in reforming social security, for example. Uh, and in the foreign, uh, uh, foreign assistance area, where the President put in place some extraordinary 
extraordinarily aggressive and successful programs to uh, attack the scourge of AIDS and malaria, uh, especially in Africa. Right, and, and also programs like the Millennium Development the Millennium, Corporation. Yep, the, yeah, the, the Millennium Senator Challenge Corporation. Talked about that. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of having uh, played a small part in the, in the creation of that initiative, which mm -hmm. um, the Obama administration, to its credit, is, uh, is continuing on, even though it's, it's a program associated with President Bush and in, in, the president, in the present partisan environment would be pretty easy to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, to its credit, the Obama administration is continuing to pursue mm -hmm. uh, that initiative, mm -hmm. which, is, which is designed to reform foreign aid in a way uh, that, uh, that ensures that the aid goes to those countries that have done the best themselves, that are in the best position to make good use of the aid. Have you found yourself uh, disagreeing with President Bush? And on such occasions, what did you do? Did you go along with his policies, or did you try to persuade him and change his mind? What did you do? I found myself occasionally in disagreement with, with the direction that President Bush was headed, not very often, and, and not on any uh, on any fun, truly fundamental issues. The president was very open and encouraging of his senior staff and cabinet to disagree with the way he was going. He was, he was keen to hear the disagreements. So I always felt free, in fact I felt encouraged when I had a disagreement to step forward and make my case. Um, you needed to make your case succinctly and effectively, but you yeah. always got a hearing, including me. Yeah. And uh, occasionally I would change the president's mind. Uh, more often I wouldn't. Do you and care to give us an example where you disagreed and... and no. Uh, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, one, that's one area where uh, I think the president needs to have confidence that his, uh, that his closest advisors are mm -hmm. going to... Um, yeah. are going to keep the confidence of sure. the Oval Office, but... Uh, my experience was that he always listened carefully, and where we disagreed, I would say he was more often right than I was. Now, in any uh, 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 private corporation, there's a fine line between what is good for management and what is good good for shareholders, uh, the, the, and the t interests of the two sides don't always coincide. Mm -hmm. Now the White House is just like a corporation, and sometimes the president's uh, the the interests of the president and the men and women who work uh, uh, for him and, 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 and uh, the president's party do not necessarily coincide with the best interests of the country and people. In such situations, how do you walk that very fine line? I don't, uh, you know, I never experienced it as, a, as much of a fine line at all. I mean, we, uh, there, there's a saying that uh, uh, the best politics is good policy, and, and we tried to uh, we tried to live that. Um, I, the, the president that I worked for, I always saw him trying to get first to the best policy based on his principles. I'm proud to say that I, uh, having been involved in most of the president's uh, policy decisions, beginning before he was president, all the way through to the end, mm -hmm. I never once saw him rely on polling to help him make a decision. We relied on political polling and political advice to decide what issue to emphasize, how to talk about it, what region of the country to talk about it in, and so on. But it, to make the basic policy choice, I never saw the president uh, do it based on, here's what the polls say is the most mm -hmm. popular thing to do. And the president, on many occasions, took unpopular positions that he thought were the right policy because that's what he thought he, he was elected to do, was mm -hmm. to use his best mm -hmm. judgment. Uh, and uh, that judgment didn't necessarily need to be the most popular thing around. So it's, it's probably not as fine a line as you might think, at least mm -hmm. in my experience and in, in, the, in, in what I think is the best in government, is make your policy choices first and then work out the politics. And um, I think uh, I think most people who have served in the White House uh, would agree with that characterization and try to run their lives that way. 
What was the biggest domestic policy issue you helped President Bush solve? Would it be the financial crisis of 2008? Yes, um, that was certainly the biggest. Uh, I mean, that was that was an international financial crisis, mm -hmm. but but it was largely um, focused here at home. It started um, here, didn't it? Yes, the crisis started here in the United States. It, it wasn't a crisis that whose origins were entirely limited to U.S. Right. banks, but it but it was all over. Right. Um, and that was the, uh, the the gravest crisis we faced outside the national security area, um, and it was a very very tough period. Um, mm -hmm. It was in in some respects, for me anyway, it was harder than the immediate aftermath of 9/11 because 9/11 felt like a discrete event, like there was there was an attack. There was a, we uh, we recovered. There was a response. Uh, we knew, uh, at least we figured out who the enemy was, um, and we were relatively united as a country in dealing with it. Mm. The financial crisis was different because we, as, as we went into each weekend in the summer and fall and into the winter of 2008 and 9, uh, we, we really didn't know where the next problem was going to come right. from or, right. or how best to deal with it or how to generate a political consensus for dealing with it. So uh, that probably was the hardest domestic issue um, that uh, certainly that I had to assist the president mm -hmm. in dealing with, and I think the president would say it was the hardest one that confronted him. And the toughest foreign policy issue? Well, uh, I mean, it had, that has to be the whole collective in the, in the war on terror and the uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that, that followed on. I mean, the, nothing preoccupies a president more than uh, putting troops in harm's way, and uh, the president was no different from that. He would. Uh, um, I, I mentioned in the first part of our interview that the president would get to his desk at 6:45 every morning, and one of the first things on his desk would be a um, a blue sheet of paper. Uh, with the overnight intelligence and some important news items on it prepared by the Situation Room uh, in, in the basement of the White House. And the first item always on that was the overnight casualty report from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I would often come in and see that that had been circled by the President or that he would be, he would be reflecting on that. Um, it's a grave responsibility to bear, which uh, President Bush, I thought, bore with um, with great sensitivity and, and dignity. What uh, was the most frustrating uh, um, domestic and foreign policy experience that you had where you've, you and the President and, and everybody else in the White House worked as hard as you could, but things just sort of ran away? Took a, took on a life of its own. Yeah, we, we had we had more than one of those experiences. Um, let me see if I can pick out uh, one or two that um, were particularly important. Uh, the the financial crisis was one. We I mean we responded aggressively, very aggressively, um, uh, on a lot of different occasions, and it it was a it was the kind of crisis that was just hard to keep control of. Ultimately, we did, and. <clears throat> the president's objective having been to turn over uh, the economy in uh, the best possible condition um, to his successor and to make some tough choices during his term that might relieve them from his, uh, his successor, and I think he did that successfully. But there were a lot of other issues of, of significant but lesser magnitude, um, like Social Security, uh, like immigration, on both of which issues, I thought President Bush um, was advancing very smart, uh, very thoughtful plans that should have attracted bipartisan support. Um, and uh, in Social Security, I thought we had the right plan for dealing with the long-term uh, crisis that that, um, that that program is in. Um, we did not get good political support for that, and we and we failed mm -hmm. with that plan. I believe that ultimately the country will return to a plan very similar to what President Bush was pushing mm -hmm. uh, in 2005 and 2006. Immigration, 
was a domestic initiative that we followed on. And on that issue, once again, I believe that, uh, that President Bush hit it, hit the issue right down the middle of where I think the American people, most of the American people would like to see that issue going, a sensible resolution. And we came very close. We had real bipartisan support. Um, we came within a couple of votes in the Senate of actually mm -hmm. having that program adopted. And I think those two, Social Security and immigration, are among the biggest policy disappointments uh, that I have that, uh, that were not accomplished in the Bush administration. But I'm proud of the positions we took, and I believe those positions will ultimately be the solutions that the country adopts. Now, one of the jobs uh, of a White House Chief of Staff is to settle disputes among cabinet members and, and, and uh, officials. Um, <laughs> and it's also one of the toughest jobs. So how did you settle uh, disputes when they fight and disagree, say, uh, Secretary uh, Rumsfeld, who is a fellow Princetonian, you both went to Princeton, but he wouldn't be the easiest person to deal with. And, uh, and or with, with, with some, you know, the, the, the generals or with whoever else, Homeland Security. How did you go about settling these fights? Uh, well, first of all, I found Secretary Rumsfeld a very easy person to deal with in the oh. sense that he's, he's very professional, very straight, very honest, not, not the kind of guy who would, uh, you know, take mm -hmm. a different position and try to mm -hmm. affect it around behind your back. He's a, um, if, if he's going to stab you, he's going to stab you in the chest. And, uh, and I give him a lot of credit for, uh, for integrity and honesty. Um, but in my role as chief of staff, that was, uh, that role often is a referee. Um, and if the issue did not deserve presidential attention, uh, then the chief of staff often has to step in and serve the role of, of referee. And I would often say to the cabinet officers, um, here, you guys, you guys get together and work that out. And if you can't work it out, uh, I will step in and mediate, um, because I don't think either one of you wants wants us to take up the time of the president on this issue. But if it was a truly presidential issue that is important enough to use up the president's time mm -hmm. and be of of the kind of significance that I think the American people would want their president focusing on. Um, I didn't necessarily view my role as refereeing to avoid a dispute. I, uh, I took my role often as intentionally provoking a dispute because there's a, there's a funny thing that happens when people get into the Oval Office. They, uh, the edges seem to come off. They become much more compliant and cooperative. Mm. And uh, even cabinet officers, but uh, but also many others, when they when they come into the Oval Office, they hate to present the president with a problem because they feel like they failed him. Mm. That the president has so many burdens, and here we are bringing yet another disagreement to him and making his life harder. And so the instinct of many cabinet officers and other senior officials is, boy, when we take this to the president, let's. Let's see if we can reach some sort of compromise. You know, you say two, I say four. You know, let's let's just go tell the president we've agreed on three. Mm -hmm. I took my role to sniff that out and to make sure that the president heard two and four on an important issue and was able to make the decision himself. And often the president would hear two and four and he'd say five. Uh, and that was often the, the actually the right answer to take is is to uh, is to not just compromise among your advisors, but to use your own principles to make a decision. Mm -hmm. President Bush is an excellent decision maker. He's he's an excellent chief executive, and so I took it as my role not to keep decisions away from him, but if they were important enough to make sure that he had he the president. Not a compromise. He, the president, had an opportunity to make the decisions among his cabinet officers, and he did. Now, we, uh, we, uh, I have a lot more questions to ask you, so I'm going to give you three in one rapid fire. Right. What was the most difficult day for you as chief of staff, and the most joyous day, and the toughest assignment President Bush gave you? If you can say that, maybe in a minute or so. Okay. Uh, uh, the most difficult day was uh, September 11th, um, and I was I was the deputy chief of staff at the time, um, but because the president was traveling and Andy Card uh, 
Mm. His chief of staff was with him in Florida at the time of the attack. Uh, I was the acting chief of staff at the mm. White House, and so um, I was there when uh, when the White House was evacuated, when the key members of the senior staff went with the vice president to the bunker that is located uh, underneath the grounds of the White House, mm -hmm. um, and was there also when the president returned later that evening. Um, that, uh, that has to count as okay. the toughest day, not only in my career, uh, but also um, in, in the history of that particular presidency. Uh, the most joyous day, uh, I think, was, for me anyway, was um, when, uh, when we got the, um, uh, the President's AIDS program announced, uh, with the help of Senator Bill Frist, who was a big moving force behind that. I, th I thought that was a, just a fabulous program and uh, that generated very broad bipartisan support um, and uh, a, a very joyous day for me, anyway, was when we um, was when we uh, uh, got that accomplished as legislation, and when we were on the way to uh, what uh, what, in retrospect, has to be regarded as one of President Bush's best legacy, which is two million people in Africa alive today who otherwise would not be alive, but for the generosity of the American people. Uh, toughest assignment, um, not a particular assignment that the president gave me, but uh, the president said when he asked me to be chief of staff, look, you, you know, this organization has now been around for more than five years. We operated with basically the same team. There's a lot of stability on the White House team, a lot of loyalty to the president and loyalty from the president back to these folks. Uh, and he said, but every organization needs refreshing. You refresh it as you think you need to do. And um, so I had, uh, I had some personnel shuffling to do, had, had folks to remove, folks to replace, um, new folks to bring in. And um, I found that uh, because, because personal feelings are involved. Um, I, w I found that to be the personally most difficult stuff that I had to do as chief of staff. And what grade would you give yourself on that score? You know, I... Uh, on you don't have to answer it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll answer. Um, I, uh, uh, of all the things I did as chief of staff, I give myself the best grade on personnel. Um, so okay. what I will take the most credit for as chief of staff is having um, helped to bring in very good, energetic, smart, talented people uh, into the White House, into the broader administration to assist the President on dealing with the biggest problems of the day. So the thing I take most credit for is uh, bringing in people who actually did the, the really impressive things. Um, you have, um, uh, you held, many say, is the second most powerful position in America, you saw it all, you, you were there. Uh, what worries you about America today? Uh, terrorism, wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, economy, the deficit, Medicare, Social Security, or America's place in the world, which many say is slipping or beginning to slip? Uh, my answer to that list is yes. All of them. All of the above, and and they and it really falls into into two categories. I think the first thing that everybody involved in government has to be, and in, it, who cares about this country, has to be worried about is the security of this country. We remain under threat every day, and it was demonstrated just a couple of weeks ago uh, when our uh, when enemies of the United States and our way of life tried to uh, tried to. Uh, set off a car bomb in Times Square. Mm -hmm. So um, while we've been, uh, we've been very fortunate since 9-11 um, and the country has been uh, very vigilant since 9-11, um, people can never forget that we, we remain under threat. There is an enemy out there that wants to do harm, physical harm and economic harm to the American people, mm -hmm. to our way of life. Uh, and until that's resolved, I don't, I don't think we can ever be comfortable. The other threat is economic, and all, all the economic issues are, are tied, in my judgment, to the same core problem, which is the long-term fiscal challenge that this country faces. 
the long-term fiscal challenge is largely a product of promises in our entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, uh, that we have made to future generations that we cannot afford to keep. And um, the economic health of this country in the long run will be dependent on the economic health of the, of the Treasury, of our fiscal situation. And we can't get that under control until we get the entitlement crisis under control. Very difficult problems, um, but in my judgment, all solvable if we generate in this country the kind of uh, bipartisan political cooperation and political courage that will be necessary to fix mm. them. Now, you adore policy uh, uh, work and working for the government. If and when someday a Republican is elected to the, to the White House and the President says, Josh, pick, what would you like to do, work in this White House? What would you pick? You know, uh, I, w I would say I've, I've had the most fortunate career in public service that I could, uh, I could possibly have imagined to have had the opportunity to serve as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy, to have served as the mm -hmm. Budget Director, uh, and to have served as Chief of Staff. I could not possibly imagine uh, any one of those three when I, when I was a student here at Princeton. Uh, graduating, if I, if you had told me I was going to have any one of those three jobs at some point in my career, I would have considered that an extraordinary stroke of good luck. Uh, I've had all three, so I think I would say to any uh, any new Republican president, uh, get yourself some fresh legs. I've I've had the opportunity to do uh, the best that I can do. I'm I'm very proud of it, and I'd be glad to help you find somebody else who would feel the same way. That's an excellent answer. And this concludes uh, our conversation with Josh Bolton, President George W. Bush's Chief of Staff 2006 to 2009. Thank you for being with us. And this is Mei Chang for International Forum. See you next time. <music>